So uh, as you know, we've been going through the book of Romans, and uh, I think last week um, they spoke on uh, Romans chapter 5. And uh, basically, to sum it all up, as you heard it last week, but I'm just going to sum it up in one word, um, justification. Justification for your sin, justification through Christ, like your guilt and your shame has been bought and paid for. Amen. All right. And he asked me to uh, go into Romans chapter 6. So I'm going to be covering Romans 6 tonight, which in essence, um, for me, I, I feel like it covers the process of sanctification. So, so you got justification, right, which you're justified by Christ, but then you got a process. I like to call it the process. Like, I'm just going through the process, you know, because the young folks today, we like to put slang on everything. So the process or the struggle, like I'm going through it. You know what I'm saying? So for me, it's the process. But the word I have for you tonight, um, I, I pretty much put it as who or what are you a slave to? Emphasis on the who and the what. So Romans chapter 6 starting in verse one, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we continue to do what we've been doing and just let grace cover it? That's the question being asked. Certainly not. How shall we, uh, how shall we who do died, uh, mm, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Point number one, the evidence. The righteousness found through Christ that free gift of grace should create a new character and quality of life. Something should change. If you remain the same, nothing's happened. How can something happen that hasn't happened? I mean, really, it sounds crazy, but it's really that simple. How can something happen that hasn't happened? Just like we like to fuss with people who, who think that atheism is real. Well... How do you get something out of nothing? If nothing is out there and nothing exists, then how do we exist? Answer the question. A big bang, okay? Who created that if that is the case? It didn't just happen. You can't get something out of nothing. In other words, the fruit. A life that is totally submitted, you always see the evidence even in the midst of failure. Faith is step number one. We have grace through faith. It takes movement on our part. See, it takes a stepping out and saying, you know what, I need this. And you know what, I'm just going to surrender to what you have for me, Lord. And something in you changes. If you really mean what you're saying, something takes place on that day. You begin to see a new character. You begin to see things changing in your life. You, things that you used to do are not the same anymore. <laughs> you do them now and you're like, hold up. Why do I feel bad about this? You know, why do I feel guilty for what I'm doing now and I didn't before? Right. He's doing something. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, something's going on because you didn't care before. You just did it, you know? Like when we try to justify going out and getting drunk, right? It's just a drink. I'm just going to have one. And then we end up in a situation where we've had more than one, one too many. <laughs> Why do we feel bad about it then? Because we went back. We went back to what was comfortable, what made us feel comfortable in the moment, instead of running to him and saying, I need you right now. I'm having a weak moment, Lord. But he's going to let you do what you're going to do. And he's going to be right there with open arms like, hey, I haven't left you. You made a choice. I'm not going to beat you over the head, but hello, you know, I'm right here. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to move on to the next point. Well, I'm going to read Romans 6, 5 through 11, where I stopped at. 
For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So if we're freed from it, why are we still struggling with it? It says we were freed from it, but we're still dealing with it. (laughs) For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Death no longer has dominion over him. You know what that means? Since death has no more dominion over him, that means he has dominion over it. And if we died with Christ, that means we have dominion over sin in our life. (laughs) You didn't hear what I said. That means that he has given you the authority to walk over that sin and shame that you deal with and stomp it back to hell where it belongs because he gave it to you freely. It's a one-time sacrifice. So point number two, the sacrifice. Paid for. This sacrifice means paid for the legal debt, and he provides lifelong power to overcome sin and the power thereof. Amen. We do not have the strength to fight sin alone. That's why we need him. Did you hear what I said? You do not have the strength to fight it on your own. That's the whole reason he's here. That's the whole reason he went and died, was to save you, but also give you the power to overcome the sin that he's already died for. (laughs) That's crazy if you think about it. Because he's like, wait, I've already been justified, but now you're going to cover me enough to where I can go through this process and I can fall. (laughs) But you're right there with open arms. But so many times we as Christians get caught up in the cycle of, you know what, I keep failing, so I'm just going to keep going back. I did it. I did it for seven years of my life. I kept falling. I kept coming to the Lord, and I'm like, I, I go back out there, and I face the same struggles, and I fall into it again, and I'm like, I'm not worthy enough to go back over here. I'm just going to stay over here. It don't last long. A couple months later, I'm running back to the altar again, crying my eyes out, and I'm like, God, I need your help. But, oh, I'm going to run back over here and smoke some more weed. Oh, I'm I'm, going to go back over here, Lord. It was that roller coaster back and forth. I was literally doing this. If you see me pacing over here sometimes, (laughs) it's because I'm talking to him. Because this is what I used to do. I used to go back and forth, back and forth. I was running this way, and then I was running that way. I I feel like I was being pulled two different directions, right? right? That's what it does. And see, I didn't even realize I was no longer a slave to sin because he died for that. I allowed myself to be a slave to the sin that was already bought and paid for because I didn't know my place with him. (laughs) I didn't know the power that he gave me, the authority that he gave me through what he did for me. Death don't have dominion over him. We being believers have faith, live for him. Therefore, we receive the power of the resurrection with him. We are raised to new life through him. Just because you get saved doesn't mean everything's gonna change like that. You gotta give yourself more credit than that. I'm gonna be honest with you. It's hard. The hardest walk you will ever walk is a walk for the Lord. But the, it's, it's got the most worth at the end of it. It's got the most worth in the middle of it. 
Because even when you feel like everything is against you, oh, he's right there. He's doing something. He's working. He's moving. There's a testimony in the middle of all of it. No matter how you feel, it don't matter how you feel. So, so many people are based off feelings nowadays. Guess what? It's going to be okay. It don't matter how you feel today. You may not feel that way tomorrow. Feelings change. He never does. His word stays the same. Nothing is going to change. If he said it, he's doing it. He's already did it. It's done. Amen. I'm going to move on. Romans 6, 12 through 19. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. <laughs> I'm going to move on because if I don't, I'm, I'm going to get back to it, I promise. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. That's right, pastor. Say it again. No. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to, you obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Get back to that too. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your bodies as slaves of righteousness for holiness. That's a lot but I'm gonna to try to help you unpack it in simple terms, all right? Because I need simple myself. Point number three, the power. Mm. You're not under law, which means you're not under the weight of rules and regulations, religion. You're under grace, which is love, mercy, and guidance in simple terms. Which means that the grace covers you because he loves you. He shows mercy because he has grace for you, right? And he also guides you in the direction you should go. Therefore, you're not under law. You're under the Father. What does the Father do? He guides you. He teaches you. He protects you. Sometimes when you're out of line, you got to get punishment but he, he's right there. He's still guiding you. He's directing you. He's like, come on, come on, I'm right here. And he's got his arms wide open. The story of the prodigal son, we all know it. His arms are wide open waiting for his son that squandered everything to come running back to him. That's a, that's a prime example of a lot of us in this room. We have to come running back to him because we went and squandered everything because we thought we could do it ourselves. Remember what I said earlier? Who or what are you a slave to? Sin that leads to death eternally or obedience leading to righteousness? Your victory is found in the obedience that leads to righteousness. It's a simple act of obedience, church. Did you hear me? It's a simple act of obedience, church. That's it. But we're so stubborn that we don't see it. <laughs> it's right in our face. He's like, I have righteousness. I have everything right here for you. But you got a choice to make. Do you want to keep wallowing in self-pity? Do you want to wallow in that sin that you've been carrying for 20 plus years? That's something he asked me. Do I want to be a result of my family life? Growing up by myself pretty much? In a house with no father, watching my mother get abused. My mother kicking me out when I was 14 years old. Running the streets, acting stupid, 
selling drugs, doing drugs, drinking alcohol, having sex. Let's be real tonight. That was me. But that's not my identity anymore. Come on, somebody. That's not my identity anymore. But I made a choice. I have many friends that haven't made it that I grew up with. They're either in jail, dead, or still on drugs. That's not a joke. That's serious. I have a really good friend who was a Christian that just died recently, and I had to go to his funeral. This world around us is a mess, y'all, even for Christian people. So somebody out here has to be willing to grab their brother and their sister and let's go on a walk. Let's go on a journey. Let's walk together because we're not meant to do this alone. That's the whole reason Pastor Richard does what he does. That's the whole reason the church is here because the community needs each other. But if nobody's showing up and doing anything, how do we move forward? He didn't tell me to say that. <laughs> it's real, y'all. We need each other. But we have to be honest with ourselves and with other people. And see, if you can't trust them, that's fine. Find somebody you can, but get it out. Get it out. Be real. The guy that passed away recently, the realest person I've ever met. He would literally walk up to you and say exactly how he felt. And it would have the F word in it. It would have every other word in it. But he said it. But he genuinely wanted help. He genuinely wanted to change. He said, I don't want to keep doing this. I don't want to keep going back to drugs. I don't want to keep struggling. Who's going to help these people? The church. We're supposed to, right? But this is a message for the individual tonight. Because if we can get the individual figured out, you come together as a body, things change. The city changes. The world changes. Jesus is able to do so much more when we just come together and snap out of it and say, there's a mission. There's something that we're supposed to do. Your pastor can't do it by himself. Shame is not of God. You hear me? As someone who struggled with shame for so long, I can tell you with boldness and with faith coming out of my mouth, shame is not from God. There's something that God is trying to reveal in your spirit, in your heart, in your soul that he wants to deal with. Let it go. Let it go. That's why you keep feeling shame. That's why you're afraid to come in his house because he's gonna confront you. I wasn't afraid to come to his house. I was afraid of going back out of it. Because I know that world all too well. And it's had its way with me far too many times. But I knew this was the only place where I had peace. The only place where I felt wanted. The only place where I felt love. The only place where I felt grace was right here. Because the voices were so loud out there. And when you're in the room by yourself, they get even louder. And they want to shut you up. When I tell you that every time Pastor Richard asks me to get on this stage and speak to you, the enemy is always waiting to punch me in the mouth. But guess what? I say, no matter what you do to me, I'm going to step out and do exactly what I'm supposed to do because I know who has the authority and it's not you. I'm not finished, but I'm going to read the last few verses, verses for you. I broke my pen. That's what fell apart all over here. 
because I was beating on my, you know. Amen. <laughs> the Lord has a sense of humor, I promise. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness in the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The gift. How many love gifts? I know I do. Never really got many until my lovely wife came in the picture. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> but we love gifts, right? If Patrick and Richard had walked up to me and said, hey, brother, I just want to give you $500, I'd be like, hallelujah. <laughs> I can pay my light bill. <laughs> Duke Energy is going to take all of it. She knows I start sweating, boy. Mm. The old, oh, my final point. <laughs> I got you. The final point, the victory. We heard a lot tonight, but there's a victory. The ultimate victory is the free gift of God in eternal life. Choose today, today. Will you continue to be a slave to the entanglement and bondage of sin, or will you choose to die to yourself and receive new life through grace? See, it's not about perfection. It's not what he's saying. You know, we read a few verses that said something about not allowing the lusts in your body, the, you know, your, your hands and your arms, and to act out in lust, right? And be a slave to that sin, that type of sin. But so many times we refer to things as, oh, that's my flesh, right? <laughs> that's just my flesh, right? You know? And I mean, accurate, you know. It, it is your sin nature. It is your flesh, per se. But if that's supposed to be dead, why do we refer back to it? I mean, I'm just, I'm just asking a question because I ask myself that. I'm like, yeah, I say, you know, that's my flesh rising up. Well, why is it rising up? It shouldn't be there to begin with. So are we going to talk to it like it's supposed to exist and stay with us? Or are we going to talk to it like we have authority over it and kill it? Cut it off at the supply because we give it the air to breathe. Did you hear what I said? We give it the air to breathe. He gives us the air to breathe. Yahweh. That's literally a breath. That's the name for God. Yah. Yahweh. It's a breath. He is the breath in your lungs. So do you not think for one second that he loves you regardless of your shame? He loves you regardless of your struggle? He loves you regardless of the things that you find yourself in time and time and time again. He loves you even though you make a choice to keep going back. It's comfortable. Don't get me wrong. It's, oh, it's comfortable. But the enemy knows how to make something look amazing and tempting. Why do you think Jesus was, so, was tempted by him when he was hungry? You know, and the enemy's like, you know, if you're God, you can turn this to bread. You know, like, obviously, he can turn it to bread. That don't mean he's going to. You know what I mean? Like, but just think about yourself in that moment. If you're fasting, doing the Daniel fast with the church, and you're on day 15, and somebody walks in with a big barley and burger cheeseburger, come on, you're going to be hungry. You're going to be like, man, I want that so bad. And the enemy's like, it's right here. You can have it. You know what? Somebody just bought this and paid for it. It's, it's free. He loves to mimic God, don't he? It's not free if it costs you everything. 
It's not free if it costs you your soul. He loves to make things look little. Nobody will ever know, Pastor Richard. Nobody will ever know. Nobody's going to see me out on a, on a Thursday night, you know, going to the bar, having some whiskey. You know, nothing's wrong. I've had a hard week, right? Get drunk out of my mind. Get in my car. I'm going home. My wife's at home, been waiting on me for, you know, six hours. I've been at the bar, flirting with the waitress, leaving a tip, drinking liquor. And I hit a 16-year-old girl on the way home from the bar, walking in the street. Nobody will know. It's real. That stuff happens, right? We hear about it. We see it on fighting crime on Facebook. Let's talk about it. It's real. Your sin will find you out. Deal with it now or the consequences later. And I'm speaking from experience, y'all. <laughs> I've dealt with the consequences later. And it's not the way you want to go. It's better to confront it up front. He's giving you a free chance every time you walk in those doors. And the, the pastor says, if there's anybody in here that needs to come and leave something at the altar today, that's your opportunity. Matter of fact, your opportunity as soon as you walk through the door. No, your opportunity actually is when you wake up out of bed that morning. Y'all, he's everywhere. He's not just in these blue walls right here. He shows up, yes. Thankful for that. Thankful for my pastor. I'm thankful for my leaders. I'm thankful for everybody. But it's personal. And the nitty gritty is when it's personal. Now granted, we receive victory having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God. See, slaves of God is not the same thing as the slaves of sin. Because being a slave for God is not actually being a slave at all. You serve him, yes. But how much often, more often, does sin serve you? And what I mean by that is pieces of you go with your sin everywhere. You never feel whole anymore. Your sin is serving you. While Jesus is like, come serve me. Come follow me. I'll make you whole. I'm the living water. I'm the bread of life. Drink from my cup, you'll never thirst again. Why do you need whiskey? Drink from his word, it's alive. We said it at the beginning. This word is alive, right? We believe that. If we believe it, why are we dead inside? When pastor asked me to preach on this, <laughs> I told, him, I told him back there, I said, you know, I kind of wrote some notes down. I said, but there's so many things that you can unpack in just short little chapter. So much. Because this is literally our life, church. This chapter is how we walk our life. The end, the victory, is glorification. That's when we're present with the Father. Like, when we reach heaven, we are now in our glorified bodies, Right? but it's a process of sanctification. And it's also our choice. And I'm not saying the moment that you come down here and lay it all down, that you walk out the door and, and, and everything's different. If it was, there would be no need for a process. I didn't change overnight, y'all. Far from it. But the enemy has constantly been a nagging voice in my life and he's constantly tried to take me out since I was a baby since I was a young kid my appendix almost bursting um, by the time I was 18 years old I had a high blood pressure I was put in an ambulance on the way to the hospital at 19 almost had a heart attack okay I've been battling high blood pressure anxiety um, um, panic attacks the last few years and still dealing with high blood pressure and I'm only 30 years old. 
The enemy can't do anything that God doesn't allow, right? So God allows things to shape you. And maybe, just maybe, God allowed all these things for me to stand right here tonight and speak to somebody in this room just so they have an opportunity to receive that free gift. Just maybe God moved on Pastor Richard all those years ago for just one individual that walks in this church, even if he preaches to the masses for thousands, thousands of messages, right? If he reaches one person, is it worth it, Pastor? We have a responsibility. We have a choice. Who or what are you a slave to? We have an opportunity tonight, church. If somebody wants to come up, and we'll begin to close this. We have an opportunity tonight, church. We've heard what a life that's surrendered to him looks like the evidence of it. We've heard where the power comes from. And it's simply from your word that we've heard these things. And we've also heard the victory. But we know that no matter what, there's a choice. Had I not made a choice to leave everything and go to Bible school, over six years ago, I would not be where I'm at today. I would not have my wife. I would not have near half of what I have now. And you wanna know the funny part about it, guys? <laughs> this just popped in my head. I'm working at the same job I was at when I left right now, and I'm making $5 an hour more than when I left. It's not much because inflation is insane. But God's funny because he'll put you right back to impact even one person and it's worth it. Even if I hate it, even if it sucks some days, I'm just like, God, I gotta find the beauty in this because this ain't it. <laughs> I'm just being honest, y'all. But I know what it looks like to have victory also know what it looks like to have failure. We learn that God gives us authority over the sin that tries to enslave us, even as Christians. And I know my buddy wouldn't mind me sharing this that just passed away because he's honest as I said before he was poisoned by fentanyl he struggled with addiction he came from a life of nothing his dream was to leave home and go to Bible school he went it was hard, but God made a way. A random stranger, the stranger showed up to his funeral. I met that guy. But a random stranger paid for his first year at Summit in full and his plane ticket to get there. Because he said, I'm stepping out in faith. I know God's gonna provide because he asked me to go. And a random stranger overheard him talking to somebody and said, hey, God told me to pay your way. He went to Bible school. The first year, he, he went home, went back home to the same environment. He fell back into drugs. He got back on heroin. I'm the first person he called. He said, Christian, I feel so sick. I feel so shameful. Is that me? feel so sick and I've never felt like this before when I did it but I feel like something's not right 
I said, God's convicting you. I said, I know it's, it's a strong chemical and I know this drug is, is not easily done away with. I said, but God's given you victory before and he'll give you victory again. So I called the school. It was during the summer. I was in Jacksonville, Florida, serving at the church. I called the school and I said, hey, Daniel needs help. So they brought him to the school and they gave him a job while he was there during the summer. He, he went and finished his senior year and graduated. He went home, he was a top salesman at at and I'm trying to shorten it up for you. He was doing great. He's got a job offer from Florida. I told him not to go. Cause it sounded like, to me it sounded like a scam, you know. One of those too good to be true things. They normally are. And I said, Daniel, don't do it. He's like, hey, but Bubba. He's like, I can, I can really do good. I can do something. You know, that's the way he talked. He's like, he's from Louisiana. He's like, come on, Bubba. Come on. You know what I'm saying? And I said, Daniel, money isn't everything. I said, you're back home and you're not on drugs and you're the top salesman in AT&T right there in the same environment that you grew up in. God's doing something. But he went anyway because he's stubborn, right, like a lot of us. He hit me up. He said, I'm struggling out here. I'm barely eating. He moved back home. He hit me up. And he told me, I need to talk to you, man. I'm struggling bad. I told him I'd call him later. A week later, I got the phone call. They found him dead. And I thought maybe he got back on heroin, right? Because we automatically think that we know something. And I'm, I'm being honest. That's what I thought in my mind. I was like, he done, he done went and did it again. And it took him out this time. Because he's overdosed before, three times. And God kept him for a reason, right? I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up. When I got there, I found out the truth. I found out that he was sold some painkillers. So instead of going back to heroin, he was like, I need something because I'm, I'm, I'm about to spaz out, you know? And he started taking painkillers. He took two and they found him dead. The painkillers wasn't what he thought they were. They were mixed with fentanyl. He took his life. But I know he would have me share that today for somebody in this room to let you know that the victory is his and that I have no doubt in my mind that he is present in glory. He made mistakes, but, but his sin was paid for in full. He surrendered and he said, God, no matter what, I need your help, Lord. He always cried out and he always knew where to run and he always did so. And granted, I don't know what he said to the Lord while he was laying in his bed that night, right before it happened. None of us do. But I can tell you one thing. I know for the rest of my life, I wanna be more like Daniel. Honest. Honest with everyone honest with myself, honest with my wife, honest with everyone. Because if we're not honest with ourselves, how can we be honest before God? How can we get victory in our life if we're not honest? So church, I asked Pastor Jason if he could do a song that was really on my heart and it fits right with this message. And he's winging it. <laughs> I hit him up. He's not winging it. He's got it. But I texted him right when I was sitting right there. And I said, hey, man, I need you to play this. But this is a song that really touched Daniel's life. And it's a song that really touched my life. Where it talks about, I'm no longer a slave to sin. But I'm a child of God. See, we're no longer slaves to sin, church. When we receive Christ, we're not a slave to sin. The sin is a slave to us. We have authority over that sin. We need to walk in it. The authority that Christ has given us through what he did for us, the price that he paid for us. 
So as we go into this song, church, just think about that one thing or many things that you've been slave to. And tonight, if you need to make a declaration and say, you know what? Like the song says, I'm no longer a slave to sin, but I'm a child of God. If that's something you've never said before, I want you to run to this altar as we go into this song, because I guarantee you, if you run and leave it all here, you will not walk out of here the same. You may have the same battles facing you when you walk out that door, but you're gonna be different. You're gonna feel different. Things are gonna happen in your life and something's gonna change inside of you because you surrendered it to the only one that can change it.